Good morning, our viewers. Welcome to the distinguished lecture on behalf of the Council for Strategic Affairs. Today, we have a distinguished lecture by Admiral Sanatan Kulchreshtha. Admiral Sanatan Kulchreshtha will be talking about Philippines China conflict and what are its implications for Indo Pacific security. So I'm trying to have my PowerPoint open and I'm having a little bit of difficulty in that process. I will try to introduce him without our PowerPoint. So a little bit about Council for Strategic Affairs. Council for Strategic Affairs imparts education in the field of international relations. CSA fosters discussion, dialogue and debate on geopolitical issues. We encourage strategic studies in general to raise the level of awareness. And we encourage publication of articles on geopolitics. CSA condemns terrorism in all its forms worldwide. And the Council aims to contribute towards world peace and prosperity. We have a monthly roundtable discussion every second Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern Daytime. We also have a monthly guest lecture by a domain expert on fourth Saturday of each month at 10 a.m. Eastern Daytime, just like we are having today. We have one on one interviews called Strategically Speaking with Dr. Adityanji. And we have conferences, symposia, and meetings. We promote publication of articles on geopolitics and related subjects. We have a summer internship program for college students and a fellowship training program in strategic studies. Our distinguished speaker today is Admiral Sanatan Kulshresht. Rear Admiral Sanatan Kulshresht is an alumnus of Jodhpur University with gold medal in solid state physics in his post graduation. He joined Indian Navy in the year 1975 and was awarded silver medal at the Naval Academy, the telescope and the sword of honor for being a judge, the best naval officer during initial training. He did his specialization in quality assurance of naval armaments and adorned various key appointments at Naval Command Headquarters, DRDO establishments, ordnance factories, and finally rose to become the Director General of Naval Armament Inspection at the Integrated Headquarters of Ministry of Defense Navy. During his career spanning over three decades in the armament quality organization in the Indian Navy, he has gained and attained thorough knowledge of quality assurance of sophisticated naval armaments, quality management systems, project management, negotiation on technical as well as financial subjects. He will be speaking on China-Philippines maritime conflict, threat to Indo-Pacific security, uh, this conflict poses a significant threat to Indo-Pacific security with both countries having territorial claims in what I would call the West Philippine Sea, also called as South China Sea. China's aggressive actions such as firing water cannons at Philippines vessels have raised concerns. Recently, there was ramming of a Chinese naval vessel with a Philippines boat, Filipino boat. Philippines is strengthening its alliances with other countries to deter Chinese aggression and maintain regional stability. But China does adopt a bully approach by trying to deal with all the members of ASEAN 
Association of Southeast Asian Nations and with the nations that have competing claims in West Philippine Sea as well as in South China Sea by dealing with them individually, either trying to bribe them or bully them. China also has raised its voice against quote unquote meddling by outside forces, implying that United States should not basically intervene if there is a problem. So, although on my PowerPoint there were a lot of uh, uh, maps, but because I cannot project my PowerPoint, I will invite our distinguished speaker, Admiral Sanatan Kulshresh, to start with his presentation. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adityanji. It is always a pleasure to come and speak for CSA, though it uh, demands a lot of work and preparation, without which I feel afraid to come and talk to you, because your introduction itself is so comprehensive that uh, one feels, you know, intimidated, that one has to find, uh, you know, places of talk which are unique. So this time I prepared a rather lengthy talk as I shared with you. So I'll start with my presentation by sharing uh, my screen. Please let me know if it is available to you. Is the screen visible to you, Dr. Adityan? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, then here I start. Uh, I'll be a bit fast in my talk. If there is any issue, then we can discuss at a later time. Okay. The Philippines holds a special position in Southeast Asia. Its unique location between the Pacific Ocean and South China Sea provides an unmatched advantage in terms of geography. This puts Philippines in the middle of major sea routes used by many countries for trade and navigation. As a result, the Philippines has become a crucial player in the dynamic Indo-Pacific region. Its position not only shapes its own national interests, but also impacts broader regional security dynamics. The Philippines' role as a central player in the Indo-Pacific region is not just a product of its geography, but is deeply rooted in its history. The archipelago has long been a prize for empires because of its strategic maritime location and rich natural resources. The Philippines the Philippines experience in World War II, particularly with Japanese occupation and consequential battles alongside Allied forces, underscored its ge geostrategic value. Post-war of independence laid the groundwork for the country's pivotal role as a foundation of democracy in Southeast Asia during the Cold War. The maritime history of Philippines is not just a tale of seafaring and trade, but also a prelude to its pivotal role in global warfare. In the 15th century, the archipelago underwent significant expansion and the state formation driven by the demands and opportunities for maritime exploration. Navigators set sails across the vast oceans, charting new routes and forging connections that would mark Philippines as a nexus of cultural and economic exchange. The growth of power Powerful coastal polities during this period is remarkable. Rising from a scattered collection of barangays or tribal units, these states harness the wealth of their marine surroundings to build societies with intricate social structures and governance systems. Trade flourished as Philippines developed extensive commerce with neighboring Asian giants. Links with China brought silk, porcelain and tea. From India came spices, textiles, and precious stones, while contact with Arab traders introduced Islamic influence. In November 1564, Spain under King Philip II conquered and colonized the Philippines. The merging of Spanish and Portuguese crowns under Iberian Union of 1580-1640 helped make permanent the mutual recognition of Spanish claim to the Philippines as well as Portugal's claim to the Spice Islands or the Moluccas. From 1565 to 1821, Philippines was governed as a part of the Mexico-based Viceroyalty of New Spain, which was later administered from Madrid following the Mexican War of Independence. 
There were three naval actions between Dutch Corsairs and Spanish forces in 1610, 1617, and 1624, known as the first, second, and third battles of Playa Honda, respectively. The second battle is the most famous and celebrated of the three, with even forces, that is, 10 ships versus 10 ships, resulting in Dutch losing their flagships and retreating. Only the third battle of 1624 resulted in Dutch naval victory. In 1646, a series of five naval actions known as the Battles of La Naval de Manila were fought between the forces of Spain and Dutch Republic as a part of 80 years war. Although Spanish forces consisted of just two Manila galleons and a galley of crews composed of Filipino volunteers against three separate Dutch squadrons totaling 18 ships, the Dutch squadrons were severely defeated by the Spanish Filipino forces forcing the Dutch to abandon their plans for an invasion of Philippines. British forces occupied Manila from 1762 to 1764. However, they were unable to extend their conquest outside Manila as the Filipinos stayed loyal to the remaining Spanish community outside Manila. The Spanish-American War began on 25th April 1898. On 1st May 1898, in the Battle of Manila Bay, the Asiatic squadron of the U.S. Navy, led by Commodore George Dewey aboard USS Olympia, decisively defeated the Spanish naval forces in the Philippines. With the loss of naval forces and the control of Manila Bay, Spain lost the ability to defend Manila and therefore the Philippines. The American occupation, however, was not expected and meant not accepted, and many rebellious skirmishes took place until 1913 after which Americans ruled undisputedly until Japan occupied Philippines from 1942 to 1945. The transformation of Philippines from a bustling trade hub to a prime target during World War II demonstrates a pivotal moment in history. Japanese military strategists recognized the archipelago's strategic importance. On 8 December 1941, surprisingly, coinciding with the attack on Pearl Harbor due to the international dateline, Japanese forces commenced their assault on the Philippines. Luzon, the largest island in Manila, became an early focal point for invading forces. Following the surrender of Filipino and American troops on 9th April 1942, prisoners of war endured a treacherous 65-mile march to prison camps. This event has been etched into history due to its extreme cruelty and loss of life. The geography of the Philippines made it extremely important for the major naval powers, especially the U.S. Navy, during World War II. Its location was like a bridge over the vast Pacific Ocean, providing a starting point for military operations and defense against further Japanese expansion. Being close to the Pacific Ocean, the Philippines provided access to important sea routes and potential targets for air attacks on Japanese-held territories. The islands had the capacity to have large naval bases and airfields which were necessary for launching counterattacks in the area. Manila Bay was especially notable as a natural harbor that could hold large fleets, making it an ideal place for naval operations. The road to freedom for the Philippines was difficult. This required bravery and selflessness from many individuals, in particular the US, USA FFE or the United States Armed Forces in the Far East and Filipino veterans played a crucial role in the fight for liberation from Japanese rule. The USA FFE was composed of both Filipino and American forces who joined hands to take back the Philippines. This unity showed their unwavering resolve against the Japanese. Even in the face of circumstances, they fought with incredible bravery and skills, proving themselves to be formidable opponents. The liberation of Philippines was not an immediate event but a series of major offenses, offensives that spanned an year, starting with General Douglas MacArthur's famous landing at Lieth in October 94, 1944 with the Battle of Lieth Gulf. The Allies launched Operation Musketeer, a multi-pronged assault designed to reclaim the Philippines. The courage and resilience displayed by the Filipino soldiers were pivotal in this phase. This was followed by the Battle of Luzon, in January 1945 and the recapture of Manila in March 1945. The Battle of Manila stands out as a particularly significant 
as particularly significant. This intense clash happened within the city itself and is remembered today as one of the largest urban battles of World War II. Japanese soldiers fought fiercely, causing widespread destruction and loss of civilian lives. However, amidst this devastation, the resilience of the Filipino people shone through. Despite facing unimaginable hardships, Filipino soldiers, alongside their American allies, managed to free their homeland from the Japanese control. This arduous journey towards liberation culminated in July 1945 when Japanese forces surrendered at Baguio City. The recognition of these brave Filipino veterans came much later. In 2016, over 77 decades after World War II ended, they were awarded one of the America's highest civilian honors, the Congressional Gold Medal. These historical experiences have profoundly shaped the Filipino identity, infusing it with a spirit of courage and persistence. Liberation from wartime atrocities marked not just a return to sovereignty, but also set the nation on a path towards self-determination. Philippine foreign policy remains intricately woven with its historical experiences, informing its position amidst contemporary regional power dynamics. The ge geopolitical environment of the Philippines is fraught with challenges stemming from the regional power dynamics. At the heart of these challenges lies China's assertiveness in the South China Sea, a vast expense critical for international trade and rich in resources. The Chinese militarization of artificial islands and maritime claims conflict with those of Philippines, affecting not only sovereignty issue, but also fishing rights and energy exploration. Issues pertain to China transforming reefs into military outposts equipped with airstrips and missile defense systems, Philippines maintaining its territorial claims based on historical usage and international law as upheld by 2016 Hague arbitration ruling which China rejected. Proximity to Taiwan Straits results in increased military activity around Philippines, including frequent Chinese naval maneuvers. The potential for conflict escalation here could involve the Philippines given its strategic alliance with Taiwan's key backer, the United States. Strategic partnerships with the United States place the Philippines at the crossroads of superpower competition. Military cooperation measures include joint exercises and defense aid, bolstering Philippine capabilities in response to regional threats. These factors require a delicate balancing act by Philippines. Its strategic calculus must weigh national sovereignty against economic interest and dip diplomatic relations. The nation's approach to national security continues to evolve as it seeks to uphold its territorial integrity while engaging with both regional allies and larger powers vying for influence. The foreign policy of Philippines is like walking on a tightrope, skillfully managing the complicated world of geopolitics to maintain and strengthen alliances. Despite China's growing power, the relationship between Philips and the United States remains strong. Simultaneously, the Philippines is working on building closer connections with China. This delicate approach shows how flexible and adaptable a country can be when it comes to international relationships. The advantage of this strategy are as under. Enhanced diplomatic leverage by, delivering with, by dealing with both China and United States, the Philippines places itself in a position where it can influence decisions that affect the region and its own interest. Having good relations with both these major powers can bring economic advantages such as investments, trade opportunities, and financial assistance for development. The alliance with the United States gives Philippines a sense of security, while its ties with China can help prevent potential conflicts, especially in disputed areas of the sea. Of course, there are also difficulties in balancing relationship with the two powerful countries. Strategic ambiguity. It is easy to keep things equal when dealing with two nations. Philippines needs to be careful not to get too involved or appear biased towards one side. People within a country have different opinions on whether it is better to align with China or with United States. This can lead to division of public views and inconsistent policies. 
other countries in Southeast Asia may have their own ideas regarding China's growing influence. This could create disagreements within the ASEAN nations and make it harder for Philippines to lead and unite them. By adhering to this strategy, Philippines hopes to get the most of its relationships with both China and the United States while still protecting its own interest and influence in the region. Over time, this complex foreign policy will shape how the country deals with the future changes and in world politics while staying true to its role in ASEAN and beyond. Next two slides are just for a short time I will be displaying which compares China and Philippines. And as can be seen, uh, there is hardly any comparison as far as the military power is concerned. Philippines is a very small country in terms of military power. In Kindly terms of the missile slide. reach of China. Kindly move your slide. Hello? Can you please move your uh, slide? It's, it's it is moving on my screen. It is? I'm yeah, it is moving on my screen. Static on my screen. Oh, one second. Are they visible now? No. Yes. Sir, you have to do it in a PowerPoint uh, presentation slide. That's why we can see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If you keep on moving on your side in a, in a view format, we will not be able to see if you are moving it. Okay. Is this okay? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So this slide presents the uh, comparison, military power comparison between the two countries, which I don't think uh, Philippines stands any chance. In the next slide, uh, we will see uh, the uh, range of Chinese missiles, which uh, we can see even the SRBM and the IRBMs uh, can well cover Philippines without uh, any issues when fired even from the mainland of China. So what does Philippines do? Philippines has started on a path of self-reliance, regional cooperation, and building a stronger defense. The Philippines has made noteworthy progress in improving its defense capabilities in response to the changing security situation in the Indo-Pacific region. This includes acquiring new equipment, strengthening the military, and preparing its forces for current challenges. Defense modernization efforts cover various aspects, including purchase of advanced jets, supersonic missiles, naval vessels, and surveillance systems that enhance the armed forces of the Philippines. The Philippines has only one formal defense pact, that is the Mutual Defense Treaty with United States. It was uh, agreed to in 1951. This cornerstone treaty obliges both nations to come to each other's aid in case of an armed attack. Oh, this treaty, uh, in short, is very well, uh, you know, self-explanatory. However, Philippines also engages in other security collaborations through agreements and memberships. The ASEAN promotes a regional peace and stability. The Philippines has participated in joint military exercises and dialogue to foster regional security cooperation. The Five Power Defense Arrangements, FPDA, this informal arrangement involving Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, Singapore, and United Kingdom aims to maintain regional stability in Southeast Asia. While not a formal treaty, the Philippines collaborates with FPDA members on maritime security and defense issues. Beyond these, the Philippines is developing a closer defense ties with several nations through agreements and memoranda of understanding. A potential status of forces of agreement so far is under discussion with France, which would facilitate joint military exercises and training. A 2023 agreement with Japan on defense equipment and technology transfer allows Japan to share technology and potentially co-develop equipment, enhancing Philippines' military capabilities. Discussions on reciprocal access agreements are also ongoing. The renewed Defense and Security Cooperation Agreement of 2023 with Indonesia serves as the foundation for collaboration on information exchange, joint patrols, and maritime security. Uh, Philippines signed an MOU with Malaysia in 1994 for defense cooperation, maritime security, intelligence sharing, 
and capacity building. There is a MOU signed in 2001 with Bruni for defense cooperation on maritime security, training, defense technology, military exchanges, and capacity building. With India, there is an MOU on defense cooperation signed in 2006 with a joint defense cooperation committee, which provides a framework for collaboration. The recent BrahMos missile deal and discussions on defense industry cooperation display a growing strategic partnerships. Talk of a potential MOU with Canada on defense cooperation are underway, which could lead to increased collaboration in areas such as joint exercises and information sharing. The European Union has recently shifted its attention to the Indo-Pacific, outlining a strategic vision that aims to strengthen cooperation with regional players. This was motivated by the EU's commitment to support rule-based international system and address China's assertive behavior. The key elements of EU's strategy include the following. Establishing an inclusive framework for dialogue and cooperation. The EU's primary objective is to create a platform on which all relevant stakeholders can engage in open discussions and work together on shared challenges. This framework is based on two fundamental principles of respect for international law and ensuring freedom of navigation. Second point is focusing on priority areas for collaboration. This is to maximize the impact of its engagement in Indo-Pacific. The EU has identified several key areas that can contribute effectively because of shared interest with the regional partners. These areas include climate change, promoting digitalization, and advancing connectivity. The potential areas for alignment with Philippines are this evolving EU strategy presents potential areas of convergence with nations such as Philippines. The shared interests include the following sustainable development, maritime security. As archipelagic state, the EU and Philippines share concerns about maritime security threats such as piracy, illegal fishing, and maritime terrorism. Cooperation in the areas such as information sharing, capacity building can help address these challenges. Then next is upholding of international norms. Understanding the impact of EU-China relations. This point is important for us. The evolving dynamics of EU-China relations also have implications for the Philippines' geopolitical stance. While economic interdependence continues to shape EU-China ties, differences in values and concerns over China's actions in South China Sea have created tension. Key points to note are the EU's response to China's assertiveness is EU has demonstrated a willingness to push back through measures such as sanctions imposed over human rights abuses. This signifies a shift towards a more robust approach to dealing with China. For countries like Philippines that have close economic ties with EU and China, managing this delicate balance between economic interest and security consideration is crucial. The divergence between EU and China regarding certain issues may influence how countries navigate their relationship with these major powers. The interaction among these external actors, USA, the EU, China, and the Philippines adds another layer of complexity to the already intricate geopolitical landscape of Indo-Pacific region. As countries pursue their respective interests and navigate competing dynamics, the need for constructive dialogue and cooperation has become increasingly important for ensuring peace, stability, and sustainable development in the region. The China-Philippines relationship is quite complex. China and Philippines, which are geographically close neighbors, share a complex relationship marked by economic interdependence and territorial disputes. Centuries of trade and cultural exchange have intertwined China and the Philippines. However, the 20th century brought about new complexities with its rich fishing grounds and potential natural resources. The South China Sea has emerged as a major point of contention. Despite territorial disputes, China is the largest trading partner of the Philippines. Significant trade flows and Chinese investments are crucial to the Philippine economy. This economic interdependence creates a complex situation in which the Philippines seeks to balance its security concerns with economic ties to China. The relationship between two nations 
has fluctuated in recent years. The presidency of Rodrigo Duterte, that is from 2016 to 2022, prioritized economic ties with China, downplaying the South China Sea dispute. However, the current president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., has shown willingness to reassert Philippine claims while maintaining open communication channels with China. Reconciling the South China Sea dispute remains a major challenge. Both sides need to find ways to manage tensions peacefully and explore avenues for cooperation. The Philippines faces the challenge of balancing its economic ties with China and its security alliance with US, maintaining strategic autonomy that upholds nation's interest is crucial. Public opinion in Philippines holds a negative view of China due to South China Sea disputes. Addressing these concerns and fostering trust-building measures is important. Coming to the role of U.S. While not directly involved in the territorial disputes, the U.S. has been a prominent figure in this conflict due to its strategic interest in ensuring freedom of navigation through these crucial waters. To challenge China's territorial claims, the U.S. conducts freedom of navigation operations. These operations involve deploying warships within 12 nautical miles of contested territories claimed by China to demonstrate its non-recognition of Chinese sovereignty over these areas. Additionally, the U.S. provides military aid to countries such as Philippines and Vietnam as, as a counter to Chinese aggression. The Philippines Mutual Defense Treaty could potentially be involved in response to an armed attack on Philippine forces, public vessels, or aircraft in South China Sea. By standing up against China's unilateral alterations of the status quo in these contested waters, the U.S. aims to deny any further escalation of conflict and uphold international maritime laws. ASEANs hold significant weight in regional security because of the following reasons. ASEAN members collectively negotiate with larger powers such as China on issues such as maritime security and trade. The ASEAN works towards peaceful resolutions to dispute among its members with external parties. ASEAN promotes economic growth and stability through regional cooperation which can counterbalance external pressures. China's interactions with ASEAN are complex. While it seeks economic cooperation through forums such as BRI projects within ASEAN countries, their conflict interest in territorial disputes such as those in the South China Sea pose challenges to this relationship. Nonetheless, ASEAN remains pivotal to maintaining a balance in regional power dynamics. The intricate interplay between these key players underscores the multifaceted nature of China-Philippines maritime conflict, with each actor bringing distinct motivations and resources to bear on this issue. Understanding their roles provides insight into potential outcomes of a regional security in the Indo-Pacific region. The Sino-Indian border issue throws another variable into the mix of regional tension. These border disputes resonate throughout the wider Indo-Pacific region, potentially altering alliances and security calculations. Impact with India being an integral part of Quad, border disputes can affect cooperative efforts aimed at countering China's assertiveness. Shift in military focus can take place. Heightened tensions along the Sino-Indian border could divert Chinese military resources and attention away from maritime domains, temporarily easing the pressure on Southeast Asian climates. Before I conclude, I must mention that on September 14 September 2023, the USS America an amphibious assault ship, also called a lightning carrier, took part in a large-scale naval exercise in Yellow Sea along with South Korea and Canada. The Yellow Sea is of vital importance to Beijing's strategic concerns as it is in proximity to Beijing, Tianjin, Haibai Interland, and it is also the strategic front of Shandong and Liaodong Peninsula. Uh, if you recollect, in October 1994, the USS Kitty Hawk was confronted by a Chinese nuclear submarine in the same area and had led to a critical crisis. It is speculated that this time, however, a Chinese Navy Type 055 destroyer, Wuxi, 
returned via the Tsushima Strait to the East China Sea, which prompted the USS America to exit the Yellow Sea after just five hours of the exercise. In addition, China also announced its intention to carry out the exercise in the Bohai and the Yellow Sea. China thereafter carried out a large-scale exercise with carrier Shandong and 20 other ships well beyond the first island change in the Philippine Sea between Taiwan and Guam, which is the America's largest naval base nearest to our shores. These exercises imply that China is also preparing to operate far away from its shores and close to its perceived adversary. Lot of eyebrows have been raised in the US because of this large-scale Chinese exercise with Chinese aircraft carrier. The China-Philippines maritime conflict has brought the precarious balance of power in South, of China, South China Sea to the forefront. As tensions escalate, the potential for regional security crisis poses serious challenges to East Asia's stability. This brief analysis above suggests that the regional stability of the South China Sea and East China is at risk. With the conflict escalating beyond regional borders and involving international powers such as the United States, the repercussions of the dispute may resonate beyond territorial claims and the fishing rights, potentially disrupting trade routes and increasing military tensions. Stakeholders need to understand that diplomatic resolution is crucial for preventing further escalation. Ignoring or bypassing international maritime laws and arbitration ruling exacerbates mutual distrust and hostility. I have finished. Thank you and Jai Hind. Thank you very much indeed, Admiral Kulshreshtra. Kindly stop your PowerPoint, please. Uh, very I have stopped. Thank you. Very fascinating talk with a lot of history being uh, discussed in this particular uh, presentation. So I am very, very thankful. Although you started with the history, I may remind our viewers that the nation of Philippines, as it is called now, did have a lot of Indic influences in pre-European colonization era. And you still find actually artifacts of Indic origin, icons or idols of Vishnu, in fact, uh, some of the common words in parlance uh, and some of the trade names in Philippines are of ancient Indic origin. So there is a brand name called Sita. <laughs> food food uh, producer. So just wanted to bring that into consideration. Now, Discussing the various players in having problems with Philippines, uh, I think there are two things we need to consider, and you tried to mention at least one of them, the internal politics of Philippines. And you mentioned about Rodrigo Duterte, who had rather taken uh, stance of appeasing China in the maritime conflict and deliberately not making an assertion about international tribunal, you know, making the decision in favor of Philippines. That was a huge mistake of Himalayan proportions for the nation of Philippines. So we did not consider that into this dynamics. And while we are discussing Philippines and other external players, whether it's EU, Canada, France, or United States, there is some discomfort about ASEAN-Philippines relationship. And I think our viewers need to understand that. 
although ASEAN has done a good job of maintaining peace, fostering prosperity in the region, but some of the attempts are very half-hearted because they cannot take the bullying behavior by China by its own. Since year 2000, China has been pretending to negotiate a code of conduct with ASEAN countries. It hasn't led to anything. Because Chinese strategy, as has with line border dispute with India, is to delay, 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 and continue its aggressive behavior. So that has been a shortfall of ASEAN, that ASEAN has not been able to negotiate effectively a code of conduct in the region of South China Sea with China. The other issue is that the heterogeneity in the ASEAN countries and Philippines facing its own internal terrorist challenges. Everyone knows that there was problem in island of Mindanao and Moro National Liberation Front had waged a war against government of Philippines for secession. There it brings the intra-ASEAN rivalries because there are countries that are Islamic countries like Malaysia, who are hell-bent on having closer relationship with China. So they may not actually favor the claims of Philippines. So these are the other, you know, givens, foundational issues that are affecting the relationship of Philippines with China. Any comments on that? No, I agree with you, uh, Dr. Adityanji. Uh, since uh, already I was, you know, dealing with so many issues, I uh, skipped uh, the internal politics and all. I just wanted to bring out uh, what the Filipinos are made of and uh, the amount of wars which they have fought and the resilience which they have shown. Even such a small nation uh, can teach a lesson to a big bully if required. I think you are perfectly so, right. Yeah. Perfectly so we right. should not uh, take that Philippines is a small country. It is small. I agree with that. But it can fight to thin nail if required. So for the sake of our viewers, I'm able to put my PowerPoint, some selected maps. It, this one slide shows actually South China Sea. And this one actually is much more clear cut. Here is Philippines, here is China. This entire South China Sea is claimed by China. Very interesting. And this map actually shows you various islands uh, in the region. And it gives you this particular slide, the Spratly Islands, which is claimed by China, Vietnam, Philippines, and Taiwan. And these are the Scarborough Shoals, which are the bone of contention between China and the Philippines. So if you look at the location of Scarborough Shoals, China claims it to be its own, whereas it is just west to Philippines. And again, a picture of Scarborough Shoals, that again, the same one. Spratly Islands. So I just put it because viewers should have some understanding where these islands are. United States had two naval bases, Clark and Subic Bay naval bases, because of internal democracy problems in Philippines against the dictatorship of. Ferdinand Marcos Sr. United States was forced to withdraw and hand over those two bases back to the government of Philippines. How much impact that has on the current dynamics between China and Philippines? That you have. Uh, uh, just just two days back, uh, President Biden has said we will honor the military defense treaty with Philippines if China attacks Philippines. 
So I'm just, what more can be said? I'm just uh, considering did it enhance the expansionist appetite of China as the US lost its role or lost its moorings in the naval sense by losing those two bases? That's the question I have. I agree with you there. But again, uh, they have, uh, you know, with the South Pacific Islands, they have again passed the budget, which was hanging for some time, very recently. So again, I think the uh, US is trying to see uh, what it can, you know, salvage in South uh, Pacific. And this uh, recent exercise of Chinese aircraft carrier close to Guam is definitely an eye opener for them. Because the war will not be fought in the cow's tongue. It can be fought outside, you know, nearer to Japan, Philippines and Guam. I just saw a news that government of Philippines is going to develop a port facility in one of the Batanes Islands, which is just 200 kilometers away from Taiwan, independently without the involvement of United States. So it looks like that Philippines under the current administration, instead of being cowed down by China, is taking much more assertive actions and is not willing to back down. Is that your observation also? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> now that brings us, you did mention about, you know, sale of Brahmo's missiles to Philippines by India. Does India have any naval role vis-a-vis -vis Philippines in providing I'd... strategic stability in Indo-Pacific? We are only there as a part of Quad as of now. To be very frank, we don't have that much of resources. Last lecture also I had brought out that point. You know, with China sitting on our land border, we have to guard our sea borders also. Because their submarines keep coming and I'm sure after a few uh, years or in few months, Chinese will pull out a map, you know, saying from ancient times, Andaman and Nicobar was theirs. So we have to be prepared for all this. Now, in that vein, preparing for the future, the plan is the largest Navy in the world at this point in time. Plans plan is to have 1,000 ships in their Navy. Yes. They have dual use mercantile vessels since 2009, that all their mercantile merchant Navy is now retrofitted for dual use. And they actually adopt the tactics of, you know, naval swamps and they'll send 50 ships to one of the Philippines islands uh, where uh, Philippines naval forces get overwhelmed because they cannot deal with so many ships. There is a plan by China to have at least six aircraft carrier formations by 2035. India is now planning for a third aircraft carrier. And it has been my pet peeve that India should have at least six aircraft carrier formations for power projection. However, planners will say that it is very costly, but there is no budgetary allocation for that. But when we are planning for any threat perception and dealing with the maritime threats, which are ever increasing in Indian Ocean region, with China coming now into Maldives, would it behoove government of India to have a long-term plan for power projection and have six aircraft carrier formations, if not by 2035, at least by 2040, so that we can effectively counter Chinese naval threat and not just be lulled by complacency that there's a choke point at Malacca Straits. I think the planners have already considered all that 
and if you have been following the uh, indian press the fight for third career also took a, a, quite a long time you know with strong objections from the other two services but i am happy that uh, government has finally agreed for it so uh, looking at six i have my doubts whether by 2050 we will have six uh, one point i want to bring out is that uh, the operational availability of a carrier of uh, you know say china will be only 40% so out of six two or three maximum will be available at a time and that applies to us carriers also so that part has to be seen and that again applies to indian india also. yes india also so uh, ins vikramaditya is yeah. always under some kind of repair yes. and fitting so yes. at least yes. one yes. career we can keep will be yes yes uh not available uh but i think for future security of india it is imperative that we yes you know, treat our navy well and it's not a question of nuclear powered submarine versus aircraft carrier formations actually we need both if we have to counter this threat of china in the indo pacific and as india becomes a regional security provider i am avoiding the term net security provider a regional security provider india will have to improve the capacity and capability in the region to counter the naval threats that are coming from china i agree with you we don't seem to have very many questions from our uh, audience i do see ambassador kapoor there in the audience maybe i'll invite him to ask any questions or make any comments on this kapoor ambassador kapoor do you have any questions or comments we would learn a lot from his comments no i have been listening to the comments of uh, dr kulsheshta very very keenly and enjoying them and this is a very important uh, theater which is uh, suddenly become very active and uh, hostile and i guess it's going to be you know a trend setter also because uh, with the heat increasing over taiwan with the uh, you know philippines sort of stepping its back against china and in spite of the ruling uh, by the international court on the islands uh, which said philippines as a legitimate claim china has refused to accept that also so a lot of these issues are going to come to a boil uh, in the near future and the different scenarios i would like to hear from dr kulshreshta in the sense that uh, you know he has analyzed very well about all the support which philippines has available all the inherent strengths but uh, if push comes to a shove what would be the scenarios vis-a-vis -vis philippines and china primarily and how would that play out and if uh, china launches an attack on taiwan how would that play out so that is not part of the talk today but still as an extrapolation thank you dr aditya ji and thank you dr kulshreshta <coughs> sir uh, as i had also mentioned the situation in uh, uh, south china sea is very very volatile and also in the yellow sea which uh, american uh, this uh, amphibious assault ship had to scoot from there within 5 hours because a chinese uh, ship came from behind from east china sea so uh, in case of a face off i don't think china is contemplating uh, attacking philippines at this juncture it will be very foolish of them to do it because with the treaty which america has got and two days back president biden has said we will defend philippines if china attacks it 
so the uh, the usa will have to support them and it can easily escalate to a very very severe war now regarding taiwan we are keeping our fingers crossed at least i am keeping my fingers crossed that there should be no bloodshed but again america on that part has said that they accept the one china theory one nation theory so i am uh, i would like to hear from you what that means they are supporting taiwan supplying arms and they are saying it is one china theory so what does it mean yeah no but about your uh, point that america will come in very strongly yes uh, if i am sitting in washington dc and i see the distractions which have been posed by the ukraine russia war and the impact it has had on the american economy and the budget also and then there is a middle east uh, palestine israel situation which is again uh, very difficult to, to come to a sort of a acceptable solution by all sides concerned now with that perspective to have another front open up uh, far away from my border how much of interest will i have besides sending some uh, show you know flags uh, some uh, all these uh, groups career groups which they have but to actively dirty my hands and get uh, open up another front where i am directly an actor uh, how much of capacity i'll have particularly if i am almost like you know ne- nearing the end of my tenure here as president in a few months and elections are due so i am you know not very sure as to what sort of um, they have made the, those statements of course biden has made that statement very firmly but how much he'll be able to deliver on that is a very big question mark uh, that 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 i agree sir but the pacific fleet is there which is very formidable and uh, chinese today are in no position to take on that fleet they can have the missiles based on land but uh, from guam and hawaii and the pacific fleet plus the uk and uh, france australia also supporting them they can create lot of uh, trouble for china they right. can lock their ships there only i don't think china will attempt that thank you i think in all possibility china will continue to do what it has been doing continue to bully philippines yes and it is not just philippines china will continue to bully japan over senkaku islands dispute it will continue to bully taiwan in a much more assertive manner china's priority is now take over taiwan no longer by peaceful manner in a peaceful reunification in the current recent npc it has been removed the peaceful reunification so china will focus more on taking over taiwan but will continue to do the bullying behavior the issue is that an accident happening between plan and philippines naval forces escalating into a major conflict in the indo-pacific region that possibility cannot be discounted but it is unlikely that china will definitely attack directly because china believes in salami slicing whether that is on land or whether that is on the sea uh, as far as maritime issues are concerned they will continue to nibble one island at a time but not have direct conflict and their way of acquiring these islands is by bullying by anything short of a hot war what do you think about that admiral kulshrest and corruption sir we have forgotten these yeah. islands are as corrupt only to as you know yes. china is slightly less corrupt than these nations so if that can work for australia new zealand these islands are nothing australia think, also has been into serious problem because of that <clears throat> yeah but recently so, australia and uk they sort of signed a joint statement in their 2 plus 2 meeting about you know criticizing china for its uh, stance and so that may also have some sort of impact australia wavers between yes one position and the other but uh, i was you know that way the recent statement has been a 
sort of one quite a good development. Well, if there are no more questions or comments, we will close this discussion. It was an excellent presentation from Admiral Kulshreshtha. We are lucky to have you as our member of advisory board. In fact, two members of our advisory board, Ambassador Kapoor and Admiral Dr. Kulshreshtha are present today. So it's always a pleasure to hear uh, their considered very thoughtful views. Thanks a lot for enriching our knowledge about the historical dimensions and the current situation in China-Philippines conflict. And thanks a lot to our viewers who join. It's not a very, you know, kind of interesting topic for general population, but it has strategic implications much far serious than people realize. Uh, it's just one accident, one minor accident that could escalate into a major conflict. I'm also thankful to Team CSA, Mr. Ripudaman Pachauri and Mr. Rajiv Verma, who helped me set up these uh, meetings and roundtable discussions. So thanks to them also. My heartful thanks to Admiral Kulshreshtha for coming today and giving this lecture very well received very well researched very well presented thank you admiral kultreshta and we hope that you will continue to come on our platform thank you very much indeed thank you dr atityanji it is always a pleasure and as i said in the beginning i am always afraid to come and give a talk because it is such a learned platform that one keeps learning from here namaskar and jai hind